Hello guys, this episode is brought to you by Fieldpiece. Fieldpiece is the next generation of vacuum pumps will cut down on evacuation time and make oil changes on the fly a breeze. They are lightweight, durable, and feature four inline ports plus a large oil reservoir. Get pumped about these three new Fieldpiece vacuum pumps available at distributors now. Learn more at fieldpiece.com or follow us on social media at Fieldpiece Products. Thanks again and thanks for listening. We've all been there, in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly, until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Therm. United Refrigeration, Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, Click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. Question number two for the month of July. What's the flash tank pressure supposed to be? Give me a range on a transcritical booster rack. What's the flash tank pressure supposed to be? Send in your answer to ARPgiveaways at gmail.com. Have a good one, guys. John, how can you always have the right TV for the right application without carrying hundreds of valves on your truck? You can carry the hundreds of valves on a trailer behind your truck. That's too funny. That would work, but how are you going to do that? Maybe there's an easier way. You can use Sporland's interchangeable cartridge style Type Q and Type BQ uh, TEVs. Type Q is a conventional design and Type BQ is a balanced for TEV. Well, come on. I need easy. How easy is it? Uh, easy is one, two, three. And it serves thousands of unique applications. So what's the process? How do I put this together? First, you select the thermostatic element assembly. Then you select the body that you need. Then you select the right size cartridge for the application to get the proper capacity TEV for your application. And then I guess it should also be said you want to actually assemble those to a single valve. That'd probably be a good idea. Indeed. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you're always carrying the right valve for the right job then. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com and find more information on the Type Q and BQ thermostatic expansion valves. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. That's Floyd. Floyd! Welcome to Thunderdome, bitch. All right, guys. Welcome to the Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. I'm your host, Calvin Compass. And today we're going to be going over kind of like a tech tip type deal. Setting pressure patrols. Not the most super exciting, but there's some guys out there that uh, this episode will really help. So we've been asked asked to get some like some more basic stuff. So kind of back to the basics. So setting pressure controls. So I'm a big fan, guys, of setting pressure controls in your van. So meaning I will generally take and I will set pressure controls in my van with nitrogen. So if I have high pressure controls or low pressure controls, I will take the nitrogen tank, I'll hook it up to the uh, a T, 
and I'll put a gauge on there or use your actual gauges. And what I'll do is I will, you know, use the nitrogen or CO2 to put pressure on that pressure control to cut it in. And then I'll bleed pressure out to cut it out. And then I'll use my meter to see when it opens and closes. So that way I can see when that pressure control opens or closes and I could properly set it. So meaning I could properly go through and set this pressure control up. So that way I could see when it cuts in, when it cuts out, I could see all that. So I could see all, all everything set up on that. Now, it makes it a lot easier to go through and set these in your van when you're not on a unit trying to do it and trying to uh, you know constantly close the suction and open the suction to set a low pressure control and it, it's kind of all over the place and it, it takes a second to react so that's why i like to do it on nitrogen it's a lot easier it's less stressful you set it say like it's 4 p.m on a friday you know i could set this low pressure control in my van real quick with nitrogen you know test it one or two times adjust it where i need it to be and then i can throw it on the roof i gotta test it one time just to make sure it kills the compressor and i'm good to go same thing with a high pressure control high pressure control takes even less time i just you know set it to like 350 400 whatever the spec is or whatever that unit like max pressure is i'll set it to that i'll see what it trips out at so if it trips out at 450 you know and that's what i got it set to i know i'm good to go I just got to take it on the roof and test it. Same thing with fan cycling controls. I could set that much easier with fan cycling controls with doing it like that. The issue is, like, you just need to test them. Do not ever trust the dials on these, especially everything newer in the last two years. Like, the dials don't match anything. Like, I had a, a one the other day, the pressure was set 20 pounds off. I mean, for God's sakes, I had a pen thermostat the other day that was 11 degrees off right out of the box. So, like, I don't trust any of that anymore. So, I just go by setting it with nitrogen. So, I, I'm going to make sure that it, it's properly set. Yeah, I'm going to make sure it's properly set in my truck to make sure that I can go up on the roof and do this in a timely fashion and knock this job out in, you know, 10, 15 minutes instead of sitting up there for an hour trying to adjust the control because it's just easier for me. And let's be honest, I'd rather spend more time with my family than sitting on some customer's roof trying to adjust the pressure control. So that's why I generally do it with nitrogen inside the van or CO2 or a little bit of refrigerant. I mean, whatever you could do, just hook your gauge up to it or a T. I like to use stubby gauges to do them. So let's go over low pressure controls and actually testing them. So we'll go over two different methods. So we have the, we'll go over the single met compressor method first. So if you're on a single unit, single compressor, you're going to have a low pressure control and that's going to be your operating control generally. That's going to be your, you're going to have a pump down system and that's going to be your operating control meaning that that's going to shut your compressor off and that's going to start the compressor so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take and start shutting that suction or the suction ball valve or the suction service valve you're going to slowly want to shut that and what you're going to do with that is you're going to slowly restrict the flow into the compressor it's going to lower the, the compressor it's going to get lower into suction you want to get so say your cutouts 10 pounds you want to get that thing around you know eight nine pounds it's a mechanical control it's not going to be exact so you want to try to get as close as possible you get it around eight nine pounds and get it to cut out so once it cuts out you could slowly open it and see what it cuts back in at and then you could adjust your cut in and cut out now not every control is cut in and cut out some of them are event minus differential some of them are high event minus low event you need to read the manual and the actual control to see what it is, to see what it, it properly, what, what how you need to do the math on here, what scales you need to look at and adjust. Not everything is the exact same. So a Ranko may be different than a Penn, a Penn may be different than a Danfoss, a Danfoss may be different than an Emerson. So it, ju it just depends on how they're worded. So just, just keep that in mind, guys. 
and look at these. I mean, some of them are really confusing for guys. Um, I hope to put together a uh, chart that shows like different ones what what they the nomenclature means here soon. So, once you get that figured out, what the event is or what the cut in cut out is, then you can adjust this thing. You know, it may take you three or four times to get it to where you need it, to where your cut in and cut out is. Now, this is crucial because your cut out has to be lower, or I'm sorry, your cut in has to be lower than your lowest ambient. So, say in Chicago, it gets to minus 20. And it has to be lower than your running and, uh, suction. So if you're trying to run to run a minus 20 suction, <laughs> your low pressure control has to be lower than that. But if you're on a cooler and you're running a plus 20, you need to be lower than the, the lowest ambient you're going to run. So in Chicago, we may get down to minus 20 at times. So you need to be lower than that. So you need to be at like a minus 30 degree suction temp, saturation. So you need to be, I generally shoot for like, you know, 404 ish five pounds with uh 448 and 449 and r22 and 407 we've been having to put the cutouts at like one pound uh so it's you have to be like right on with these to make sure they're not running in a vacuum because a lot of these freezers especially these ogps they're running like way oversized condensing units and it, and it causes them to run lower suction so we have to run them super low so with that being said you need to make sure that switch is set like super tight so you need to be lower than the lowest ambient and the operating. So otherwise that condensing unit is not going to come on when it's super cold outside. Because what's going to happen is you're going to be below the actual uh, cut in with the, with the actual temp. So you, once you, if you're below the cut in with the ambient, you're never going to allow that compressor to come back on. So that's why it's important like when we were minus 20 for like a couple weeks straight we ended up having uh a ton of condensing units that wouldn't cut back in like that was like half of our calls were just going up there and uh setting low pressure controls that weren't set properly so just keep that in mind and then when you're testing them just you know slowly shut the compressor suction and uh you know adjust your control and you can adjust it slowly just don't don't go goosing the, 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 the dials and everything else. Just slowly adjust them to get your cut in and cut out. Now, if you have an encapsulated control, you're just going to be checking it. You may have to change your encapsulated control if it's not going to work. So generally with encapsulated controls, if I'm changing an encapsulated control, it's getting an adjustable put back in its place. I'm not a huge fan of encapsulated controls, especially on single units, uh, and especially with 448 and 449. It's just, I have to, they have to be so precise. I'm usually going with a pen micro set control or a digital control, meaning a pen uh, digital uh, pressure control, which you can get at any supply house, United, any place that carries Johns Controls pen stuff should have that. So that being said, now we're going to move on to racks. So rack low pressure controls. Now there's two different ways to do this on a rack. You're going to see these two different done two different ways. You're going to have what I call the master high pressure control, which is like the Hill, how Hill Phoenix does it, and Walmart does it, and Target does it. You'll have one high pressure control for the entire rack. So the, what they do is that high pressure control, or I'm sorry, low pressure control for the entire rack, entire rack. You're going to have one low pressure control. That low pressure control is going to uh, kill the power to time delays. And those time delays are what cycle the compressors. So generally, it'll be like 10 pounds or a couple degrees under what the EMS is. So if the EMS cutout is, say, say the EMS set point is 20 degrees, okay, that low pressure switch may cut out at 10 degrees and cut back in at 20 degrees. So what they're doing is they're using it as an operating control and a safety at the same time. To me, it's more of a safety to keep the rack from running in a vacuum, but at the same time, it's a backup operating controls if you lose your EMS or if you have a power outage to keep the EMS from just banging all the compressors on as soon as it comes on. You want that low pressure switch to take over till the EMS is ready to go. Now, the way they accomplish this is setting it lower than the EMS cutout so it doesn't fight the EMS. And then you have these time delays on there. So every compressor has a time delay on there. Your first compressor may be 30 seconds, second compressor may be two minutes, next compressor may be two minutes, next, it's whatever that customer spec is, but two minutes is a good starting time, 
And then like the last compressor, I'll usually make it like five minutes. Or if it's a bigger compressor, I'll make it like a longer time delay. So that way it doesn't bang on all the big compressors at once and then instantly trip the switch. So that's not what you want. You don't want that like to start this like vicious fight where you're fighting the low pressure control. So that's why I was time delay really there. This is not the best option because you're going to, no matter what, be fighting something. Because you're going to, no matter what, have uh, a time when you're you're going to be cycling that low pressure control. It's inevitable. So how much you're cycling depends on your load and depends on your time delays. So just keep that in mind. So what when you're cycling is, you know, you want to space those time delays out a little more, a little less. So just with that, with that being said, you can test the high pressure control. You want to make sure you uh, just front seat it a little bit, or you could test it with nitrogen to set it. You, can, you should usually take it off. It's usually on a packed angle valve. Set that puppy, and then you're going to want to trip it out and make sure all your time delays shut off. This is why jumping out time delays is a problem, because if you have jumped out time delays now, which, I mean, you see them in a lot of racks, especially at Walmart, with the time the cruisette time delays taking, you know, uh, they have a power outage and they lose a handful of cruisette time delays because you, they're made out of, like, butter and glass. So you'll have a couple bad time delays and they're jumped out. Well, now those compressors are running wild, and the low-pressure switch will not kill power to those compressors because it only kills power to the, the control aspect of it, and then that compressor... Uh, cycle off a of time delay. That's where it becomes a huge problem of bypassing time delays. If you're not careful, you're going to uh, you're going to uh, have an issue with that. So what you want to do is uh, you want to make sure all your time delays are not jumped out and functioning properly. So you'll test your low pressure control, trip it out, see what it trips out at, see what it cuts back in at, adjust it if you need to. That could, it's more so there to keep it from going in a vacuum and a backup control. And then make sure your time delays all time out properly. Make sure they're set for minutes. You know, make sure that, you know, they all cut in back to what the, the customer wants. I've seen vicious cycles where it just, like, slams on and off. So, and then now we're going to go to the rack side of it. So we, we have the rack side of it uh, with each compressor having its own individual time or low pressure control. This is the better option. Now, generally, you see Husband do this a lot, more so. So what, what Husband does is something called Switchback. Switchback has been around with Husband for, like, the entire time they've been making racks, it seems like. With the, when EMS controls were super unreliable and went down all the time, they had Switchback. Switchback is basically a relay that bypasses the low-pressure control. So what it does is, when you're in Switchback, it bypasses around the low-pressure control and allows the low pressure control to be out of the safety circuit or the operating circuit. So what this does is this keeps it from fighting the EMS, which is, this is the best option because now you're not going to have a low pressure control that's fighting the EMS. And now you can stage those low pressure controls. So you could stage those as operating controls. If you were to lose your compressor, because now they're higher up, they're tighter and they're not going to put, they're not in the loop unless the, the controller fails. So the way this works is, when the controllers in switchback are not in switchback, the EMS is running things, the relay is closed, and you're bypassing around the low pressure control and going to your next safety. And the EMS is running everything. Everything is great. When the, when the controller loses power or there's an issue with the board, say the board goes bad, it goes into switchback. When it goes into switchback, the relay opens up. Now it has to go through the low pressure control to make the next safety circuit to make the next safety in line. So then now that low pressure control is operating that compressor. So with the way this is set up is, so say you're trying to maintain a plus 20 degree rack. So your first low pressure switch may cut in at plus 18 and it may, it may cut out at, at uh, you know, plus 16. And then your next compressor may cut in at plus 20. Your next compressor may cut in at plus 22. You know, there's a lot of good charts on a lot of these older rack manuals, Tyler had a real good chart in their manual on how to set up low pressure controls, like for different suction groups. That's what I generally do. I mean, I try to get them as tight as I can and I just check them. I mean, EMS controls are a hundred times more reliable than they were 20 years ago. So 
I mean, that's why it's not as big of an issue. It's just there for an operator control if you were to lose the MS. So just keep that in mind, guys. So with that being said, once you're checking these, you have to take you have to put it into switchback mode. So you'll have to find the switchback relay, force it in the controller, and then put it in switchback mode, and then you could start testing the low pressure controls. So you can see, you just start closing the suction service valve on them, see when they cut out, see when it cut, then open it back up, see when it cuts in. You know, you can test each compressor. So then I usually write on the control. So if this one's a uh, 45 pound cut in, you know, and a uh, 35 cut out, and the next one's a 47 cut in, and then a 37 cut out, and then I just keep going down the line. You know, you may make the last compressor like the the biggest compressor may not be the last compressor. It may be like the second compressor. So just keep that in mind with staging it. You need to kind of look at how the rack runs and I'll generally look at how it runs on the EMS and that's how I'll set up the, uh, the staging. So if it's favoring like the, the biggest compressor, I may make the biggest compressor run first and then stage the other compressors later. If you look at the EMS trends, it'll give you a good idea of how to stage these, of how this rack's running which compressors it favors, which compressors it wants, which compressors run better. So um, it'll give you a better idea of uh, what you need to do and uh, how you need to run this thing. So it's not going to be the same for every single rack. Every single rack is going to be different. So just keep that in mind. So you can test every single compressor like that. And I'll write down what they're supposed to be. This is kind of a pain. I wouldn't do this on every single PM. Probably once a year it needs checked. You know, on, on a yearly in the winter time when you're slower, you know, you're looking for bad low pressure controls. You know, you need to check these. So just like a once a year thing or when you take it over an account, make sure it's set up. Because you don't want to have a guy doing this in the middle of the night. It's a pain in the ass. You want the PM guy to be doing it, want it to be set up properly, want it to be running properly. So that, that way when this controller does fail in the middle of the night, all we got to do is go there and uh, all we got to do is, you know, flip it into switchback and uh, she's good to go. And uh, it'll run properly. And then all you got to do is uh, sit there and, you know, let it run and make sure it's going to cycle properly. That's why I think the switchback way is the best way because it's not going to be fighting the safety circuit. It, or I'm sorry, the, the EMS, because if the EMS is fighting low pressure controls, you're going to have all kinds of cycling issues because it's going to be calling for compressors to be on. They're going to be locked out still on the low pressure control. And then you're going to have the, the pressure is going to build way up before it comes, it comes on. And then you're going to have overshooting because now you're calling for four compressors and you only need two. It just starts this vicious fight. You don't want that. So that's why switchback is the best. That being said, if you have individual low pressure controls and you have no switchback you need to have those set way lower than the ems the ems is going to get to so you just need to make sure you're not hitting that so if you're running like a plus you know 20 degree evaporator on the uh, rack you may need to set the low pressure controls like the to, to cut in at like 10 degrees you set it real low so that way you're not fighting the ems i mean generally customers have a spec for all that stuff now um, but if you, there is no spec, I generally set them low enough where I'm not going to fight the EMS. That is my hundred percent like goal not to fight the EMS because that's how you end up with cycling issues. So, and I don't want that. I don't want to have cycling issues. So I will set the EMS up that way. So that way we don't cycle. Now, testing them. I mean, low pressure switches fail all the time. I mean, Yet a member, this is a mechanical device. It's on the front of a rack. It's going to vibrate. So just keep that in mind. Just test them. And then if they're not shutting compressors off, just make sure it's not, make sure you're not wired to switch back and you're not, you make sure you're testing it and switch back and kill, take the wire off. If it's, if it's not wired and switch back and it's still not killing the compressor, no matter what you do, pull the wire off the low pressure control. Somebody may have bypassed it or wired it wrong in a different spot. I see all the time where guys change compressors. They move some wiring around, and next thing you know, now safety's not working. So just keep that in mind also, guys. Just because it's not tripping out, you know, make sure that it's actually bad. And it's not just, you know, a wire off or wired wrong. So before you condemn a control, pull a wire off, one wire off of it, make sure it shuts off. So now we're going to move on to high-pressure controls. Setting high-pressure controls, I generally do it the same way. Uh, 
that we just talked about with the nitrogen before I before I change them, and then I'll install them and then test them real quick. Easiest way to test high pressure controls is to start slowly closing the discharge service valve. See what it trips out at. You know, once you get to about 90% closed, that's when you're gonna start increasing your pressure and you just gotta be very careful to watch the gauge. I usually use a stubby uh, uh, Elko gauge, little stubby digital where I get zero to 500 pounds. I can you know, watch it and make sure that it's actually gonna trip out where it's supposed to. And then I could set the high pressure control or and or test it. Meaning if I need to set it, I could set it. If I need to test it, I could test it. So I could do it that way. That's generally how I do it because I think it's easier. If you're on a single unit and you don't, you can't use nitrogen, then I'll set it just by closing the discharge service valve. Now, if you have nuisance alarms, I mean, I think high pressure switches should be checked on every PM because it's it's a uh, important safety and they go bad and it'll blow a compressor up, it'll blow a head, it'll blow a relief. Yeah, it's a refrigerant loss fuck it, uh, scenario. <laughs> depending on if you have a relief or not. In Chicago, everything has their relief, so even single units. So it's a refrigerant loss to me. So it's it's vital for it to be checked. On a rack, what I'll generally do is there's two ways to test this. So I'm going to go over the first way. So I will individually test each one. I'll put my gauge on the compressor service valve. I'll start to front seat the service valve. I'll get it to where right about where it should be if it's supposed to be at... Uh, Three, you know, 350, I'll make sure it trips out at 350, and uh, then I'll test it, and then it, I'll adjust it from there. If it trips out at 370, I'll lower it down, and I'll try it again, make sure it trips at 350. If it doesn't trip at all, then we got a problem. So then I will pull a wire off of it and make sure it, you know, it kills it. If it kills it and it, it uh, still is good, then I will, uh, I'll, uh, Today's episode is sponsored by the new Reefer Shield Differential Pressure Monitor from Westermeyer Industries. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Way too long to replace and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. But replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The new Reefer Shield RDP-01 Differential Pressure Monitor is available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerind.com. That's sales at westermeyerind.com. Uh, I, I will test it that way. Uh, I'll test it that way and uh, check it. So... If it, if it kills it when we pull the wire off, I know the pressure control's bad. And then I'll just change the pressure control. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll test it and set it in my van and get it all ready to go. And then I'll install it on the unit. Now, the second way to test these is I will do all of them at once. So say I'm on a rack and I'm doing a PM and I'm trying to get through this PM and I want to make sure everything's set. I will close down the main discharge ball valve with one compressor running. And... I'll see what that guy trips out at. If it trips out at 350, okay, all the other compressors should have tripped too. Now I'll start the rack back up, and I'll see which ones didn't trip. Now I'll test those individually. So instead of testing seven compressors to see what they trip at, now I'm testing, you know, say compressor two and three didn't trip. Now I'll test two and three individually. So now I saved a bunch of time because I'm only testing two compressors manually instead of seven compressors manually. So it, were, it may have saved me like an hour and a half on a PM. Now I'm only doing it like 20 minutes worth of work. So, and then I'll adjust and or condemn those pressure controls. So that it's a lot easier for me to do it that way. Uh, I'll, t I'll trip the whole rack at the same time. You're going to have to override the EMS set point. And I'll trip the whole rack at the same time. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll make sure that uh, it actually... Uh, it, it takes all of them out, and then I'll adjust from there. So that to me is a lot easier than doing it. Uh, than doing it, you know, each compressor at a, at a time. It makes my life a lot easier, and it makes the PM go by quicker. So 
that is how I test all the high pressure controls at the same time. So that way I could uh, move on quickly and then I'll adjust them. If you have the Emerson Alco ones, the encapsulated black ones, you can still adjust those ones. On the front of the uh, high pressure control, the opposite end of the electrical, there's a little uh, nipple on there. You can pop a nipple out and a 0.5 millimeter Allen key goes in there and you could adjust the, uh, the high pressure control that way. So just be very slow with it. I mean, it goes pretty quick. So that's how you set those ones. And then also, while you're doing this, guys, you want to test the alarm circuit on these. You want to make sure the right compressor is alarming. So when you first take over a store, you're going to test them individually. You know, I'm going to you know, make sure compressor one goes in alarm. Make sure it alarms correctly on the EMS. We had a store where you know, a guy went out there three different times for compressor number three alarming. And you know, he changed the high pressure control. He checked the wiring. He thought it was a Novar issue. When all reality, it was compressor one alarming. Compressor one and three, the safety uh, inputs the dry contacts for the relays got flip flopped around in Novar, so nobody ever checked it when they did startup. This uh, factory startup, it got missed because compressor one high pressure control alarm was actually uh, to compressor three's input, so three and one were flipped around, and then they were getting alarms. So they that that when really it was compressor one high pressure control having an issue, not compressor three. So, I mean, right there, guys, that's why, like, checking to make sure, like, on PMs, that the correct alarm and EMS is going off is going off. So, that's why it's imperative that you, when, you, when you're testing these high-pressure controls, you make sure that the correct high-pressure control alarm is going off. Especially if this is a new store, you've never been there, and you're testing things, because that could easily happen, and you could be working on the wrong compressor. You know, even though it says, you know, compressor 3 is alarming, it's really compressor 1. So just keep that in mind, guys, when you're doing these, that you need to check the EMS alarms at the same time. Uh, at the same time of doing these. So when you're moving through this now, you're testing these high pressure controls. You want them to, you know, cycle properly. Now we're gonna move on to fan cycling controls. I imperative same thing. Nitrogen in the van with fan cycling controls, anywhere from a 35 to 50 pound differential. Fan cycling controls are not the best. I mean, they're, I generally use them to reduce the charge on, uh, reduce the charge on a system, meaning I, I don't need to run two fans in the winter time. It, all winter long, I can run one fan and it makes this system more energy efficient. If I'm not running both fans at the same time, I can only run one fan and I can be more efficient or I could uh, run both fans and just flood the coil more and just waste a bunch of energy. So it's easier to run less fans. It makes it more efficient. It makes it uh, to where you don't have to uh, put as much charge in there early on. It just makes it a lot easier to uh, run the system. So I generally will use the fan cycling for that on single units. On rack condensers, you're going to have fan cycling. Most of the time it's EMS controlled. We'll go over that in a second. But with fan cycling, generally 50 to 35 pound differential is what you're going to see. You don't want to run over that. You don't really want to run under that because what ends up happening is if the differential is too tight, you're going to cycle the fan too much. You're either A, going to wear out the control, or B, you're going to wear out the fan motor. Because if it's a single... Uh, Phase fan motor, I mean, you're talking a lot of cycling. It's a PC, PSC motor. It's not designed for that. I mean, it could cause problems. So wear and tear, blades breaking, it's just not a good sign. And, and it, it'll flex the condenser if it's micro channel. So you just want to be aware of all that. So when you're setting fan cycling up, I will generally set it up. So like if fan one cuts in at a 75 degree condensing, fan two will cut in at like 85, fan three at uh, 90. I'll generally step it up like five or 10 degrees and then same thing down, like five or 10 degrees down. So you don't want them to fight each other. You want fan three to shut off before fan two cuts in. You don't want them to fight each other. Now, that being said, setting fan controls, I usually set them with nitrogen. I'm not a big fan of fan cycling control. If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try to do it with uh, uh, pen digital. So that way I, I can have uh, fan cycling controls, but it's all digital and it's a little bit more crisp and you can get it a little tighter and all all together i think it works better 
So that way you're, you're using digital controls and not, not using uh, mechanical controls. But again, don't trust the dials. And then you wanted to make sure it's not too tight. You're not causing cycling issues with the fans. And if it's a system where it only has one fan, you may not want to cycle it off because if that compressor is not refrigerant cooled and it's air cooled, now that compressor is overheating because you're shutting off the fan in the wintertime. Yeah, the ambient's cold, but it's not getting that air over that compressor like it's designed for. And you may be overheating that pump. So that's one thing you guys may need to keep in mind. That's where flooding controls are far more superior than fan cycling controls. Like in Chicago when it was minus 20 not too long ago, we had a bunch of units, everything that just had fan cycling controls and no actual uh, normal controls, meaning flooding controls. It was, uh, they were all, those units were all down. So just keep that in mind, guys, for when you're doing these, that you need to have that actual flooding control also. So that flooding control is imperative for that to work properly. I mean, if, if, the, if the ambient temp gets down so low, it only works so well. I mean, now fan cycling controls and racks. So generally, the EMS is going to cycle the fans. So that's going to have a pressure cut in, cut out. We're not going to go over that today. That's, uh, that's a completely different episode. Now, backup controls in the racks. Uh, some of the targets, you'll see some uh, backup controls, like pen microsets in there, fan cycling controls. They have them set up for backups. The EMS relay bypasses that. And then it allows it to come on and it allows it to, if the EMS is down, it allows the fan cycling controls to take over. So that way you're going to maintain head pressure. Great idea. It's a backup. I think it works great. You just need to set them properly and check them to whatever the spec is. And then the second you're going to see is Hussman a lot will put in uh, fan cycling controls on their condenser fans. And what they will do is they will use the, a pen digital like pressure transducer and a sequencer uh, bank, meaning it's it's individual relay banks, and they'll have a set point of, say, 160, and then they'll have 10 pounds. Every time it gets 10 pounds higher, it'll bring another fan, another fan, another fan, and then it goes lower, 10 pounds lower, 10 pounds lower, 10 pounds lower, it'll start cutting fans out. Great control to have as a backup. You know, there's nothing wrong with having that as a backup control. It works great. You know, if you lose your condenser control, the board goes bad, something happens, rack goes into comm loss, uh, something happens with the EMS, you still have backup controls. I like that idea. So, but generally I test them to make sure they work. So I'll put the, the racket switch back. I'll make sure that it actually works. I mean, generally they're wired to switch back too. It has another relay for switch back. I'll make sure that works, make sure it cycles properly. Uh, generally it's set to 20 pounds. I usually set it to 10 pound differential. So that way it's a little bit tighter. Uh, just make sure it's, make sure it's not fighting the rack. That's my biggest thing for fan cycling but uh, now we'll move on to uh, oil controls so oil control same thing uh testing the oil safeties mechanicals just uh i generally will flop the compressor breaker off and test them this works for probably 90 percent of compressors out there you know you're you're you have bellows in there you have a low and high uh, bellows and if it doesn't see a differential it starts timing out we'll go over a whole other episode we've gone over oil controls so I'll make this one brief so it starts timing out now that mechanical control is going to time out now what you want to do is if you have a current sensing relay or a uh, uh, current sensing relay or a uh, auxiliary side connector controlling the actual compressor uh, l2 or uh, 2 on the oil control it's not going to time out when you shut the power off. So what you have to do in that scenario is actually take and uh, you have to actually take and jump those out or jam in the contactor with the power off, jam in the contactor so it powers up the oil control and times out. And or I'll take the, the current sensing relay and I'll take two male spades and I'll just jump it out real quick and I'll test my oil controls. And then if I have a bad oil control and it's not working properly, I will generally change it out with a pen oil control if it's a Danfoss. And if it is a Copeland compressor, it's getting a Centronic. So, or if it's a Bitzer, it's getting a P-Pen uh, 45. Uh, the Pen P45s are way better than their mechanical controls. I want electric controls on everything. 
I want to make sure that I have, you know, digital controls and everything. I, it's far more superior. They've gotten way better over time. So, it, and then there's less leak potential because now you don't have a cap tube. You have a oil sensor. So, Bitzer and Copeland, the sensor looks the exact same. Different threads, though. So, there is a different bit uh, part number for the Bitzers. You could use a Centronic on a Bitzer. You just got to get the sensor. You could use a P45 on a Copeland. You just got to get the sensor. And it just matters what P45 you get because there's different oil controls for different compressors. So Carlisle's have a different oil control part number than Copeland's. Copeland's and Bitzer's have the same oil control part numbers. Carlisle's have different oil controls because the cut-ins and cut-outs are different. So on there, so a Carlisle may cut out at 8 pounds. A Copeland's going to cut out at 9 or 10. So just be aware when you're ordering these oil controls, you're ordering the proper oil control for the proper compressor. So you're going to want that proper oil control so that way you're not putting the wrong one on there and causing a premature failure. So just be aware, guys, of what oil control you're actually ordering and what a one you have. I mean, you may have the wrong oil control for the wrong compressor, and that's why you're getting used to trips. If you have a Copeland oil control on a Carlisle compressor, and all the Carlisle with the oil control, the oil pressure's kind of getting crappy, that Copeland oil control may cut out too soon when that Carlisle still had some life left in her and uh, she could be running. So just be aware if you're having nuisance oil trips on a compressor and the oil pressure's not the best, make sure it's got the right oil pressure control on there. And then just like Carlisle, this is like Copeland and Bitzer, Carlisle makes a block adapter to go on the oil pump so you can use that P-Pen, P45, the digital oil control. I want to go over that real quick. So those digital oil controls have a jumper on there with an uh, anti-short cycle time delay. You have to set that to zero if you're using EMS controls. I, they come out, I think it's either uh, 200 or 300 seconds, which is a two or three minute time delay on there. So if you don't jump that out and you leave it as it is, it's going to fight the EMS. So it calls for a compressor to be on. It starts this, the anti-short cycle time delay and until it doesn't bring the compressor on until it times out. So then you start this vicious short cycling between the EMS and those oil controls. You may bang on three compressors in the time that it calls for that one compressor to come on. If it doesn't see it running in two minutes, hey, I got a problem. I'm going to start another one. Shoot, I don't see that one running. I'm going to start another one. And then these compressors start kicking on. And next thing you know, you overshoot set point, you're back off. So that's where this short cycling comes in. So you want to have that anti-short cycle delay set at zero because it's going to affect the EMS. That is the only uh, oil control I've seen with those, the, 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 the electronic pens. So just make sure those are set at zero. If it's a single unit, yeah, go ahead and put a time delay in there. That's fine. It'll give it a little pressure switch, a little bit of time to make, and you know, go. So just be aware of that. I mean, you do not want to have that time delay fighting the rack EMS. That's where we end up with all these issues of short cycling and everything else when the the time delays are fighting the ems so what you want to do is you want to set that at zero um you want to set that at zero so that way it doesn't fight the the rack now testing these same thing shut off the uh, power of the breaker you know make sure that you actually have power to uh, l1 and l2 and it's going to trip because if you don't have power to l uh, m and l2 you're not going to trip and that's where I've seen guys, you know, say, okay, this isn't tripping, the oil control's bad. When there's an auxiliary side connector or there is a current sensing relay to keep it from nuisance tripping, I'm not a big fan of that because what'll happen is, say, the, the compressor breaker trips or something happens, it burns a contactor out. That compressor's never going to trip on oil. And if you don't have proof failures, you're never going to know that compressor isn't running until you have more compressors go out and you have a high suction uh, pressure uh, situation because it's never going to trip on oil because it needs power on that current sensing relay to say hey this compressor's you know got you know drawing amps to close the current sensing relay to close the oil control it'll never time out so what you end up with is a compressor that's never going to trip on oil with it with it not running until it runs on it it sees it running and trips on oil so I'm not a big fan of using the current sensing relays. They, they stop nuisance calls, but they also make more the nuisance calls on the other end because now you're going to not trip on oil when a compressor breaker trips, and you're not going to know until you have a couple compressors down. So I'd rather have one nuisance call for an oil control or an oil trip, you know, that I could take care of on a, on a you know, 
you know, 7 a.m. on a Monday than uh, 5 p.m. on a Friday when the entire rack's down on oil or there's more compressors locked out. And I know because I'm running a high suction pressure. So that's why I'm not a fan of doing it like that. The auxiliary's just not as bad because at least if the contactor pulls in, but if the contactor goes bad, then uh, you're not going to know either. So you could have a storm roll through, contactor get taken out, and then you, uh, you're not going to know that you, your compressor is not running. So that's why I'd rather have the compressor trip on oil. It makes less nuisance problems than anything, I think. I'd rather have a trip on oil so that way I know. And just like I said, make sure the actual EMS relay for the oil is the correct relay. It could be, you know, you want to trip, trip, trip out number one and make sure it actually trips out number one on the EMS so that way you're not looking at the wrong compressor, you know, and somebody's not looking at the wrong compressor. So that, to me, that, that's imperative and uh, that's uh, really important so that way, you know, guys aren't looking at the wrong stuff. Now... As we move on to, you know, testing all these controls, like I've found, you know, at least generally on 1 p.m., I usually find at least one bad oil control. So, I mean, guys, it's imperative to test oil controls every single time. Whether you unplug the Centronic sensor out of the compressor and let it time out or you shut the breaker off, but you want to make sure they time out. So you want to actually test them because there's at least one bad one. Usually on every p.m. I do, there's at least one bad one that won't trip. Okay, but you want to make sure that power to L2 is there, and you want to make sure it, it runs. If, if you have a, a current sensing relay and you have Centronics, you could just unplug a sensor, and then it'll do the same thing. It's shutting the breaker off, and you want to make sure it trips. It, it, imperative. I mean, you don't want to lose a compressor on oil because you, didn't uh, you missed the bad oil control. I mean, that's easy PM work to me for apprentices to put oil controls in or whatnot, but I mean... I want to check them every single time that I'm doing a PM. Oil controls and high pressure controls every single time because those two can cost big money when there's a problem. Yeah, low pressure controls would be a problem if a rack runs in a vacuum. Yeah, it's not good. It can suck in moisture, air, other than that. But like you're you're talking loss of charge and you're talking uh, thousands of dollars for a compressor for oil controls and high pressure controls. They could both damage the compressor. They could both lose a charge. So, I mean... You're talking big money stuff, so you want to actually set these up properly and make sure they work properly every single time. So I have seen some issues with the Centronic 3s. I, I've had some weird trips. I've been putting the CoreSense protection modules in because now I can log on Modbus or I can get on my laptop and I can plug into it and see what uh, what uh, I needed to, what, what my alarms were, and it gives you a little bit more protection with it. So... It gives you a little bit more protection on that because you could see what the alarms were. It's a solid state control. It's it's a better control. So that that's what I generally will use if I can get one. They're a little bit more pricey. If it's contract stuff, I'm probably going back in with a Centronic. I mean, but it'll, I want to have a you know proper oil control. Like I said, you can retrofit the Bitzers to the Centronics. They work fine if you get the if you get the proper sensor. Bitzer sells a, a sensor for it. Like it's just a differential sensor. In the compressor, instead of uh, bellows, you have a differential sensor. So once it sees the differential from suction to oil pressure, it's going to you know close the switch. And once the switch is closed, the Centronic sees it or the P Pen 45 sees it. And then if there's no differential, the switch is open. Just like if you unplugged it, it'll it'll start timing out. The switch is open, and then you could you know check that oil control or it's going to fail on oil, and you can go from there. So that being said, guys, I mean just taking the time. Setting these up in your van, it'll save precious time later on in the job. You know, it's not as hard for you to go through and do it, you know, if you set it up properly. I generally keep only, uh, I only use pressure switches that have, like, super hose adapters on there, so quarter-inch male flares. I do not use cap tubes on anything. Oil controls, uh, pressure switches, nothing. I don't care if it has more, if it has more than five pounds in it, it's getting a uh, super hose, and it's not getting a cap tube cap tubes leak i don't want the responsibility or the potential leak and uh i'll uh i'll i'll take and put that uh cap tube on and uh i'll put the the, the armor cap tube or the uh the uh, super hose on if you're using the armor cap tubes 
make sure you snap out the uh, the Schrader depressors if you don't have them. You don't want the Schrader depressors because they will block the actual holes. I've seen compressors not trip on oil. I've seen high pressure switches not work because guys will put the uh, the Schrader adapters on there and it blocks the hole on the uh, the adapter. So you want to make sure that that hole is not blocked and that everything is uh, clear on that. So snapping those Schrader depressors out of those hoses is uh, key for that. So you want to make sure those Schrader depressors, uh, you want to make sure those Schrader depressors are uh, out of there because that'll make pressure controls not operate properly. So once those Schrader depressors are out of there, I mean, the super hoses are a lot better. But just keep that in mind, guys, when you're testing these. I found pressure controls that wouldn't trip, and I go to pull them out because I'm going to change them, and I find that the super hose is blocking the hole. And that's why the high-pressure switch didn't trip. Or that's why the low-pressure switch isn't working because the super hose is blocking the hole that the Schrader depressor is. So you want to make sure that that's you know, properly set up. I see that all the time. Or I see guys doing oil control, and they flip-flop the fucking hoses. So just make sure if you're taking them off, make sure you put the right hoses back on the right side. So I'm a big fan of the United. United has these stainless hoses. I think they work real good. So uh, I, I generally try to use the stainless hoses or the uh, two millimeter hoses that they that Phoenix sends out on the racks. I really like those. You could buy them in a kit. You could uh, make them to whatever you need to. So you could have a kit in your van where you actually just make the hose. So that's what i'm a fan of but again setting pressure controls to take your time guys set them up properly go slow and go check them and then actually check that it actually kills the power and there's not something else causing the problem because i see that all the time but that that is how i a brief overview of how i go about setting low pressure controls and setting everything up for that uh thanks for listening guys have a nice night my boys wicked smart